welcome back to another video of Smith Fishing Outdoors. I'm Fisher Smith, and this is Pat Schlapper. And today, we're going to be going through and we're going to interview him, see like what kind of stuff he uses, and how he likes to bass fish in the Bass Master. So, let's get right into it. Well, first of all, what boat do you use? Uh, the boat I'm running this year is a 2021 Skeeter FXR21. Um, same boat I had last year, just a year newer. I switched to a 21 footer uh, last year. Um, in past years I've run a 20 foot. And I've run a Skeeter for pretty much my whole career. Uh, we got a great dealership in town, the Boat Center. Uh, they actually have two locations in Eau Claire and one in Ramsey, Minnesota. So that's a big part of the reason why I run a Skeeter boat. Yeah. Um, service, like today I needed something done, I stopped down there and an hour I had it done. So, Good running boat, fast, super smooth, ton of storage. Um, it's a great boat. I mean, I couldn't imagine not, not running a Skeeter doing what I'm doing, so. Oh. It's big. It's giant. Yeah, we should shut these compartments so you can actually jump up there. And... get one. <laughs> yeah, you should. It's a lot of deck room. Yep. Yeah. Good musky boat too. Watch your head. Don't rip your head off. Yeah, so I mean I've got, I run three Humberbird Helix 12s for my main locators with all of them are side image. Actually, the front one's just down in the jig. And then I've got the Mega 360 for the Humberbird and then I run a Garmin with the live scope. And I run that all, you know, on the Minn Kota Altrex. Um, 112 pound thrust. That's what I've run for a long time. And then I've got, you know, power, two power poles. I've got a hydraulic jack plate. I've, I run lithium batteries. How often do you use the power poles? All the time. All the time? You know, load and unload the boat. I will use them a lot. This tournament on Gunnersville is mostly fishing shallow, so I use them a ton. Um, yeah, it's something once you get used to having them, you, you want them on everything. Yeah. Yeah, and then you'll notice like up front, the whole deck is padded, you know, so you don't you get a lot less fatigue when you're casting all day. Uh, a lot of times just the front part is, but the whole decks are padded on these. So it's a... Uh, it's just a lot less fatigue on your on your knees and body. Yep. Recessed foot pedal, which is pretty pretty standard now, but it's it just makes it a lot more comfortable. I got the foot switches for the power poles, so you can hit them with your feet, or I've got a switch on the dash, and then I've got a key fob I'll hang on my hip. Um, and then that side is just all rods. This center storage, which is giant, is where I keep you know a lot of the tackle I use a lot. This side I'll keep like life jackets, maybe 10 rods, um, rope, that kind of stuff. Sounds like you're just like not where you is, just 10 rods. Yeah, I don't keep that many in this <laughs> side. That side is where the bulk of them are. Yeah. And honestly, like I took, I didn't realize there was that many in there, but I took them out the other day and I'm like, I gotta count these things. I couldn't believe there was 45, there was 45 rods and reels in there. Plus I had like six just rods, extra rods. Like, holy crap. That's a lot of rods. That's a lot. And I still want to take more. More. But, yep. So it's, it's a, this boat is, I've had a lot of them over the years. And I know people say, you know, because they're sponsored by them, it's the best boat. But I mean, I've had Skeeter since 2004. I had one other boat brand, two other, my very first one wasn't a Skeeter, but. You know, I've had FX's, ZX's, and this FXR is on a different level of everything. Sweet. So, when you're pre-fishing, like, where would you start? Like, on a brand new lake you've never fished? It's a good question. I get a lot. So, the, the first thing that I typically do is I'll look at maps. You know, I'll look at a Lake Master map on my Humminbird, I'll look at a paper map, I'll look at Google Earth. Um, that's the first thing I do, and then the, the other big thing is the time of the year. So, yeah. 
if it's is it spring, is it summer, is it fall? Um, and that's that's usually the biggest thing that'll that'll get me started. If it's in the spring, I'm gonna be looking for where the fish are gonna be moving to spawn. That's what it's all about. So you're gonna want to look for flat bays. You're gonna want to look for long tapering points, close to bays. You know areas where they're gonna spawn, they're going to be close to that. So then it comes down to how far along is the spawn. Yeah. Is the water 60 degrees where they're really moving heavy? Is the water 50 degrees where they're still going to be hanging outside of them shallow flats? Yeah. So that's usually how I'll, how I'll start. Um, and then in the summer, I always try to fish start deep. I like to fish offshore structure. So in the summer when a lot of them fish after they're done spawning, they'll move out deeper. Not all of them, but a lot of them move out to, you know, deeper rock, weed lines, wood, around here, a lot of cribs, um, stuff like that. So that's where I usually will start my searches offshore, and then I'll go shallow if I have to. I so it depends on the water offshore. temp, you look for different areas to find fish. Yep, in the spring, water temp is probably one of the biggest indicators. You know, if I show up at a lake I've never been to, and I put my boat in the water and it's 45 degrees, you know, I'm probably not going to go super shallow right away. You know, I'll maybe, like I said, look at a map and kind of anticipate where I think they're going to want to go to spawn. And then I'm going to start out in front of that. Um, or say that's, a, you know, down south, there's a lot of big creek arms mm -hmm. where like their creek arms are like bigger than our lakes around here. So, you know, what happens is those fish will gradually work their way back into the back of that creek. So. You figure out are they in the middle of the creek are they at the mouth of it are they three quarters of the way back and then a lot of times you can duplicate that around the lake so you know water clarity plays a big role wind plays a big role what type of cover there is is there weeds is it wood is it rock are there small mouth are there large mouth so that's all stuff that you know you want to research as much as you can before you go to a new lake and then and then you have to use kind of your your skill and your research um, just your experience to try to locate them. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, obviously. I mean, you can see that in tournament results or the days you go out and catch a lot of fish, it worked. Mm -hmm. Well, then you go somewhere else another day and you don't catch them. You know, you don't always catch them, so. Yeah. Well, how long do you usually pre-fish for? So it depends on the tournament. So like with the Bassmaster Elite Series, we only, we have three practice days. So the lake is cut off 28 days before the tournament starts. Mm -hmm. So basically a month ahead of time, you can't be on the water. So then we show up for official practice and we have three days. And then the fourth day is the tournament. So that's what I have to do for the Elite Series, which is not super easy. You know, when I fished the Bassmaster Opens last year, there's no cutoff. So I would go for six, seven days, you know, mm -hmm. to get a good grasp of the water. Because a lot of these lakes, I've never fished them. So three days is not a lot of time. Um, locally, I would go out two or three days, depending upon the lake. So it just kind of depends on the tournament and how it's structured and what the off limits are. But um, now I'm kind of forced to do three days. Yeah. I'd like to do more, but three days. Do you like learn stuff from other big guys like Scott Martin and other guys like that? You know, I'll watch, like Scott Barnes got a great YouTube channel. Uh, he really breaks stuff down really well. He's He's got a great team that travels with him to help do that stuff. I will watch that some. What I find in myself doing this year is I'll watch their stuff after the tournament's done when they have fished the same tournament to kind of see how they caught them and compare it to what I did. And it obviously depends on how they've done. Like Brandon Polonick's another one who's got a great channel and gives a lot of good information. So I do watch some of their stuff. I do talk to a lot of them people at the weigh-ins, but you know what happens on the Elite Series and a lot of other places, other circuits, whether it's walleye, mossy, whatever, you know, what people form little groups where they'll mm -hmm. kind of talk and communicate and help each other out. And with me being new, I don't necessarily know a lot of them the big name guys you know real well, but um, there's two other guys from Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Bob Downey and Caleb Kufal, who just won on Gunnersville. Yeah. So that's kind of my group of people who I talk to. And, and and when we talk in practice, it's not like we're saying, go here, do this. It's just kind of, what are we seeing? You know, are, are you getting them up shallow? Are you getting them deep? You know, is there a certain color? Stuff like that. Yeah. So that's really who I communicate with. 
Josh Strayster, I talked to him some, who was another really good rookie from Alabama. But that's about it for me. You know, I don't really, you know, get, I'm not a big information person. I like to do stuff by myself. <laughs> um, and a lot of them big name guys that have been at it a long time, they have their little clique of people. And that's just, that's, that's how it, that's how it kind of develops as you fish longer in, in the series. So... How did you make it into the Bassmaster Elite? So last year I is when I decided to try to do it. And I, I quit my job of 16 years to just focus on trying to make the Elite Series. So there's two ways you can get in. The first way is fishing the Bassmaster Open Series, which is basically like the AAA level to yeah. get to the Elite Series. That's what you have to do to qualify. And last year there was two divisions and you had to finish in the top four in points in one of the divisions, or if you fished all eight tournaments in both divisions, or basically four in each division, they had an overall championship where they took four out of that. So they took 12 people total um, out of the Bassmaster Opens. I finished third in points in the Eastern Opens last year, so that qualified me. But then I also won the Bass Nation Championship on Pickwick Lake in, I think it was... I think it was November when I won that. Um, so that also qualified me for the Elite Series. So I'm the one person out of the entire country representing the Bass Nation, which the Bass Nation, I don't know how much you know about that. That's like the little clubs that are like around town, around each state. They'll have a, a, a BASS affiliated club. And what happens is each state will send 10 people um, to a regional tournament through a level of qualification to get to the tournament that I fished in nationals where there's basically one person from each state. I won that tournament, so I'm like the one person that qualified for the Elite Series out of the entire, basically, world, because there's countries yeah. there, too. So I got in, that's the only two ways you can get in the Elite Series. Do the Opens, winning the nation championship. So. What rod and reel combos do you mainly use? I use all St. Croix rods, so, um, I'm really lucky where when I, I've used them for years, I've sold them for years. Uh, I mean, I've been buying them since I was your age. And I have used some other brands over the years, but I'm really fortunate that when I kind of made this step and qualified, they contacted me and I've got a good partnership with them where um, they take care of me. I mean, if I need rods, they send them to me, uh, whatever I want, basically. I mean, I've got these, I've got a pile over here I haven't even that are still in packages that haven't been taken out yet. Yeah. So uh, that's what I prefer to use. Wisconsin Company, uh, most of their stuff is handmade in Park Falls, you know, by American citizens. It's it's a great company, uh, great history, and they make a, they make the be some of the best stuff out there. Period. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's what I use for rods, reels. I use a lot of different stuff. I use a lot of Shimano. I use a lot of Daiwa. I use a lot of Garcia, I've got some Luz. I mean, I kind of use a little bit of everything. I don't have a sponsorship, so I kind of buy whatever I, whatever I like. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the rods to me are more important than the reel for a, from a sponsorship end. I'm the type of person where if I don't believe in a product, you know, I'm not gonna represent them. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm really lucky that I got St. Croix. Yeah. So what baits will you have on your deck, like with your rods? Well, it all depends on the lake and what I'm doing. So these are, these, all of these rods were in that Skeeter FXR. 45 rod and reels were in there when I was on Gunnersville. Yeah. Did I have all of them out? No, but I had them rigged with a lot of different stuff. So, you know, down there, it was primarily what I caught the majority of my fish on was a, a Kariji, um, a Kriji Panic swim jig, yeah. just white and chartreuse. That's what I caught a lot of my fish on, and that's a 7.4 heavy power St. Croix Victory, mm -hmm. which, you know, people, a lot of people assume that being sponsored by St. Croix, all I will use are the the high, high end stuff, which I do have a lot of the legend, you know, the extremes, and they're great. Yeah. But they're also $650. Mm -hmm. This Victory series that we came out with this year. Um, that's a hundred and eighty to two hundred dollar rod, and made in Park Falls, 
and I absolutely love them. I have a ton of them. I keep asking for more. I keep gravitating to this particular, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, I just really love this rod and it's, and it's a very affordable rod, but that swim jig did a lot of the damage down there. And that's also a company out of Wisconsin called Kariji Sakana. Um, High-end stuff, very well made. That would that did a lot of damage. And then I caught a decent amount on just a chatterbait jackhammer. Uh, that's that's one that I caught a lot on. And then the other thing I used a lot, I don't know if I even have any. I was just using a wacky rig. Oh, let me see if this is it. I was just using a wacky rig tricks trick stick, big bite trick stick. This is it right here. No, it's not on there, but I was just using a wacky rig big bite trick stick to catch a lot of it. That's pretty much what I caught everything on. Yeah. That swim jig, chatterbait, or that wacky rig. And I don't think I caught anything else on anything in that yeah. tournament. So, so what type of line like how often do you change your line? I change my line, I'll, I'll, depending upon what kind of line it is, braid, I don't change that off. Yeah. You know, if I'm using braid, I'll leave that on there until I just don't have enough left yeah. from retying where I don't, I just can't cast it enough. Floral carbon, depending upon what I'm using, which I use all Sunline, and they make one that's called Sunline Shooter that's very high end, really expensive, but it's the best line you can buy. That stuff, I don't have to change as often because it doesn't break down near as fast as other lines. So it'll happen a lot with lower end line or like a monofilament line is the UV light. You know, the sunlight and the water will actually break that line down really fast. Um, with that, that sunlight shooter, it doesn't, it doesn't happen near as quick. So my rule of thumb is if I have any thought in my mind that the line might be compromised or week or what i just change it yeah just change it um that's as a tournament angler now as an everyday angler you don't necessarily have to do that uh generally i think people do not re-spool enough whether it's monofilament or fluorocarbon um they just don't do it enough because they don't want to spend the money on the line or they don't want to take time to do it so that's my rule of thumb if i ever feel like oh man i'm not sure about it i just spool it i have plenty of it um, I don't want to have that in the back of my mind where if I lose, you know, break off on a fish or something happens that I don't want to think back and say, man, if I had changed my line, I would have caught it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I go about it as a tournament angler. Mm -hmm. um, usually the rods that I know I'm going to use heavily in that tournament, I re-spool them fresh, you know, before the tournament for sure and a lot of times every day of the tournament. Mm -hmm. So... Not that everybody has to do that, but that's just me fishing for a hundred thousand dollars and fishing and trying to make a living. Yeah. You know, you lose one fish due to some an error that you made. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. What line do you use for like drop shots or like senkos or something? So a drop shot and actually senko. So a drop shot, I kind of go back and forth. So usually with a drop shot, I'll have one. Once again, depending upon there's a lot of factors, but a lot of times this is one of my drop shot rods. This is a six foot ten medium light power, extra fast action legend extreme. And on this one, I have just eight pound Sunline FC Sniper fluorocarbon, straight fluorocarbon. Mm -hmm. So I use that sometimes. Um, honestly, oh, if you'd have asked me a year ago, a year and a half ago, yeah. I would have told you that's all I use for drop yeah. shot in this eight pound sniper but now i've i've kind of gone back to a braid with a fluorocarbon leader a lot mm -hmm. so like this is the other one you know same rod same reel but then i'll have like a 12 pound um sunline sx1 braid and then i'll tie an eight pound fc sniper fluorocarbon leader with an fg knot on there and that's what kind of switched me over to it was i was always I didn't, when I would tie braid to fluorocarbon before, I, that FG knot, I don't know if you know how to tie that or not, but it's very, it's not super easy. Um, so I, uh, once I learned to do that, I really like throwing braid with a fluorocarbon yeah. leader. 
because you don't get the memory. It's it's just it, it works really well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, in the past ten years, what what's the best fishing tool invented? Ten years, well, I'd say side imaging is probably gonna be in that time frame, maybe a little bit longer than that. But side imaging is probably one of the biggest things, mm -hmm. just electronics in general. But side imaging is one thing that I grabbed a hold of when I was really young and learned how to use it. And I was one of the first ones around here to really harness the power of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably, probably the biggest thing in my opinion, as far as an overall, you know, piece of equipment, it would definitely yep. be side imaging. Yep. Um, what expectations do you have for a lake in the Bassmaster? So what do you mean? Like, do you th what, what do I... What, what expectations? So if you're on a brand new lake and you've heard good stuff, like, what would you think about it? Well, so that's actually a good question because a lot of the lakes we go to on the Elite Series are the ones that everybody here hears about, everybody talks about, you know, Gunnersville, Lake Fork, um, St. John's River, you know, just notorious big fish factories. But what you don't, you know, what you don't hear about is how much pressure they get. Mm -hmm. So you go to a lake like Gunnersville and there's literally hundreds of people out there every day fishing. So yes, it's a great lake, but that doesn't mean that they're easy to catch. Yeah. So that's where you'd see, you see someone go to, you know, like me, for example, on the St. John's River, you know, I had two fish the first day of the tournament. Granted, there was, you know, we had a fog delay and all that, but I caught two fish. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, how do you do that on the St. John's River where Rick Clun had 38 pounds one day? So I don't go, you know, I, I research a lake and like, okay, there's potential to catch 30 pounds. Yeah. But, you know, after I'm done practicing, if I feel like, okay, I, Gunnersville is a good example. Like I was like, if I catch 15 pounds a day, I'm going to be really, really happy. Mm -hmm. And turns out that that was a good, good yeah. tournament for me. So it kind of depends on a lot of things, the time of the year, how well you know the lake. You know, two of the tournaments we had this year, we had major flooding happen, mm -hmm. you know, right before the tournament. So a lot of these lakes that we go to are really famous lakes, but you that doesn't mean you're going to go there and catch them really well all the time. It's just yeah. that's that's one thing I really learned is you can't you can't go by what you've heard and what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to have for weight. You have to go and see what the year year brings. So I heard Mark Zona, he interviewed you, he said, or he asked you what about like Jim John and... <laughs> Jim Jack and Jim John? Yeah, what does that mean? So Jim Jack is basically, I like told Zona, that's versatile. You know, kind of any part of life you can use it. So like in that scenario, I, I had an okay practice, but I didn't really know. So I was just out kind of fishing around not really knowing what was going to happen, mm -hmm. hoping to catch one. So that's kind of that day's Jim Jack. But another one would be, say, like the guy, you're out fishing a point, right? You're throwing your yep. bait on a point, and the guy in the jet ski drives between you and the point. We've all had it happen. That's yeah. a Jim Jack mm -hmm. or a Jim John. So, so that's bad, and the other thing's good. Jim Jack and Jim John are both bad most of the time, oh. pretty much all the time. <laughs> so... Um, but anybody can use it, whether you're golfing, you're at work, you're on the road all the time. A lot of Jim Jack's on the road. So that's just something we say, if said, and like it just came out naturally in the conversation. And then Zona just like grabbed it and wanted to know more about it. So, yep. um, yeah, it was it was interesting. It was fun. What stuff I got in there. Jeez. Can't even see over top of it. <laughs> yeah, it's all in here. All baits in there? Mostly, yeah. Baits, line, reels, rods. It goes out a long ways. So that's the side that I've got a lot of plastics in. This is all line, it's all fluorocarbon. Um, there's one that's all braid. I've got a um, Floor jack in there. This is all just trees. 
it's pretty crazy what you can fit in here. Yeah. And the cool thing with this is we have a dealer in town that I got, I was able to work with, which was huge because I didn't know anything really about them. And it's super secure. There's a push button code on there or a key, obviously. I mean, you're not gonna get into it. Mm -hmm. Not gonna get into it. And that was the biggest reason for me is you hear a lot of people get stuff stolen at these tournaments. And I, I mean, just that side with the trays alone is thousands of dollars worth of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah, it's cool. It's good Very investment. cool. You actually had all these baits in your boat? Everything on this table and on against the boat for rods was in that boat. So, I mean, I've got everything from crankbaits, jerkbaits, jigs, obviously a lot of soft plastics, um, drop shot baits, flipping baits, chatter baits, swim bait heads. I mean, everything, you know, I had everything in there that I thought I needed for that particular tournament. Mm. Plus, all this stuff was in my truck. Plus, I've got a truck vault in my truck that's full. Um, so, yeah, I bring a lot of stuff with me. When you go to these tournaments, you don't really know what you're going to need. So I tend to bring, not everything. I mean, if you've seen what was in my basement, you won't believe it either. But um, I like to be prepared. So, But some of the stuff that I always have in there, regardless, is... I mean, I'll always have jigs. I use jigs a lot. You know, I'll have a box that's, like if you look at, you know, like this is a, this is like a quarter ounce jigs. That's all quarter ounce jigs and some three eighths ounce finesse jigs. And then I have a box that's just all jackhammers. I mean, there's a few other chatter baits in there. It's a lot of money worth of chatter yep, baits. Yep, yep. And then like this is all just flipping jigs. Mostly all flipping jigs, three eighths, five eighths ounce. I've got some heavier stuff in there. Um, you know, a lot of the Cree G lock and loads, which is the one that I built. This is my jig. Mm -hmm. Like I designed everything on it. I used to build them over there at my shop and in my jig tying room, but now I have a company produce them for me. So I have a ton of them because I use them all the time. Um, I just, I have a box that's just. Three eighths ounce football jigs. I have one that's five eighths ounce and half ounce. I have one that's three quarter. I have one that's one ounce. Um, I try to be as organized as I can and bring as much stuff as I can um, because you have to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't know what you're going to need. So crank baits, jerk baits. Uh, I mean, it's about anything you can imagine. I've got. And if it's not here, it's in these bags. Mm -hmm. So how did you start tying those jigs? I started making my own jigs when I was in seventh grade. How old are you are in seventh grade? I don't know. Thirteen. Thirteen. Cause that's so I started, I bought a melting pot. I bought a mold, one mold, an arky mold, or sparky mold, which is the, which is the base of that lock and load Kariji jig I showed you. Mm -hmm. That's where it came out of. And I started pouring them and then I started making skirts and then I've just done it ever since. Partially because I like to do it and then partially because I wanted to build one a certain way. I wanted a certain hook. I wanted to tie skirts. I want certain colors. I, I just, that's, I'm just really picky. And jigs are expensive. Mm -hmm. You go buy that lock and load jig, it's five bucks, five fifty. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was a kid, like, well, I could buy all the stuff to build a hundred of them for $20. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started to do. And now like I have a whole room in my house that's just for tying jigs. Granted, I don't do it as much anymore because I get a lot of them provided by, you know, Kariji. So that's how I got into it when I was young. I just, I enjoyed doing it. It's, it's, it's fun. It's kind of relaxing. You can make different things that nobody else has. And it's, it's cool. I just like doing it. Yeah, it makes sense that you can do that to make it perfect what you want it yeah. to do. Yeah, because a lot of times, and this comes from me selling tackle for a long time, you get to a lot of these companies, whether it's plastics, jigs, whatever, you start to see imperfections. You go and you buy, when I buy six jigs, say they're whatever brand they are, well, there might only be three of them that I would use because mm -hmm. the weed guard's too stiff, um, the skirt's all messed up, the color's not right, 
you know, they paint it over the eyes. You can't tie it on. It's just, you know, you, you start to spend all that money and, and then you can't use half of them. So mm -hmm. in this way, I like, okay, I know everything's perfect on this because I made it. And if it's not perfect, I don't put it in my box. Yeah. So that was part of my deal with Kariji when I got with them, because I had another company I had worked with too, is I, I was like, it, this is how it's going to be made. This is how, this is the hook. This is the screw lock I want it on it. This is the, you know, the angle of the weed guard. I'm really picky about that. Like, this is how it's going to be. And, and it's perfect. So now when I go buy one, or he sends some to me, they're all perfect because they're not made in a factory in China. They're made in Alaska, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I am, period. I see, I see how you like write what baits they are in the boxes. Yep, yep I do that a lot, most of the stuff. Um, so then, you know, when it's sitting in the compartment, these ones are pretty faded. If it's sitting up, I know exactly what it is. And then honestly, like in my boat, I I I know where everything's at for the most part, especially stuff's in there all the time. Um, but yeah, I try to label stuff to make it uh, to make it easy to find. Well, I think that's all the questions we got. And well, I think I learned a lot. I hope the viewers learned a lot. And make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next adventure.